The following podcast contains explicit language. You're listening to the Cinematography Podcast presented by Hot Rod Cameras, a program about the art, craft and philosophy of the moving image and the people who make it happen. Coming to you from the world headquarters of Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California, are your hosts, Ben Rock and Ilya Friedman. Hey, everybody. Welcome to episode eight of the Cinematography Podcast. The Ocho. <laughs> the Ocho. <laughs> You've been saving that up. Sorry, but I, you know, I'm glad we finally made it here. Yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. It's, I have to blame myself for how long it's been since our last episode. Uh, I've been uh, outrageously busy with like one project after another after another, uh, and I can't talk about most of them because of non-disclosure agreements, but what do you do? Ben is working on something really cool, and probably most of our listeners have uh, have either read it or have uh, heard of the person who wrote it. Yes, and we'll leave it mysterious right there. Okay. Uh, yeah, and uh, one of the other things that actually kept me busy since the last time we did this was the final launch of 20 Seconds to Live, the web series that Bob DeRosa, Kat Paziak, and I had been working on for over a year. Uh, we released it on uh, Aeriscope.com. That's uh, Adam Green's website. Adam Green made the Hatchet movies, made the TV series Holliston for Fearnet. Very prolific and awesome filmmaker and host of the Movie Crypt podcast, which is just an awesome podcast and you should listen to it. I'm just going to throw this out here too. something that I've been working on, which is going to start up soon. Uh, so we definitely don't have these massive, well, several month lapses in time between episodes. Uh, I'm going to be doing a little portion of this cinematography podcast called Backlight, anecdotal and rant and, you know, sort of a little snippet of things that wouldn't necessarily qualify for a full long episode of the podcast. Now it's going to be in sort of a small bite size. And I promise that I will be getting those out much, much more frequently. I look forward to hearing you rant. Uh, You've heard one or two before, and you'll get to hear a few now. I look forward to having a one-sided rant with you where I can just listen to it on my headphones and I don't have to actually, uh, you know, look you in the eye while you're ranting. Well, you, you can always feel free to respond with a backlight of your own. Fine. Maybe I will. <laughs> okay. So, Ben, let's talk about who's on the show today. Uh, today, we have Mike Mickens, fine cinematographer Mike Mickens of many awesome projects, but the one that's always closest and, and dearest in my heart leprechaun in the hood a classic of horror and horror cinema <laughs> <laughs> lip in the hood here to do no good if you've ever wanted to watch warwick davis in his full leprechaun regalia rapping now's your chance does that really happen oh yeah no the movie closes with a, a giant rap where he's like lip in the hood here to do no good it's uh, a little <laughs> little embarrassing <laughs> Wow. Um, okay. I, I didn't didn't know that, but... Uh, oh, and I want to show you something. Uh, listeners won't be able to appreciate this, but I just want to show Ilya something because we're recording this in my home office. Okay, I'm going to describe what Ben has just handed me. It appears to be a model leprechaun from the Leprechaun series, so he really is a fan. He is like, you know, die hard enough to have a four inch tall sculpture that looks hand painted and yeah. molded out of some sort of uh, clay. Yeah. It was uh this was a uh, marketing for the first leprechaun. Oh, okay. His catchphrase. <laughs> I want me gold. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm just going to put him here in front of you for the rest of the time. We're, we're thanks. Spending. I appreciate that. <laughs> so, now, and and it's it is a very greedy look they have oh, painted yeah. on his face there, and he does have outstretched arms with with claws. Oh, he's a, <laughs> he's a scary little fucker. <laughs> so, uh, so Ilya, we missed uh, episodes. Like the last thing we did was for Sundance, so mm. that was like in January. We missed NAB. We didn't get to talk about the Ursa Mini camera. No, we didn't get to talk about. There's so many things we haven't talked about. That's true. Yeah, we missed NAB. We missed Cinegear. We missed me having a medical boot on my foot for like two and a half months. I, our I, listeners cannot wait to hear about you and your medical boot. Yeah, yeah, because I, you know, tore a thing. And, mm. and yeah, anyway, so hey, but boot's gone. So uh, much better. So okay. uh, so now that we're past NAB and now that it's it's now August, mm -hmm. which means that the Ursa Mini, as predicted, was released in July and has been in the hands of users for the last month. Sadly, no. How's it going? How are the users <laughs> liking their Ursa Mini? Uh, no one has gotten their hands on on the hotly anticipated Ursa Mini. Actually, something interesting that happened today is Black 
Black Magic does a bit of a road show every year to Los Angeles. And today, uh, in August, it was their road show, and it was really well attended. There was probably more than a thousand people who showed up to, oh, their, wow. to their event today, in which a, uh, a friend of yours and mine, Dan Myrick, was gave the keynote speech. And Daniel Myrick, co-director of the Blair Witch Project. That's right. He did. He had shot something on a Black Magic pocket camera and was taking people through his workflow and samples and clips. Yeah, and he has a new feature called Under the Bed. I assume the title is going to stick. And uh, they shot it on the Blackmagic Pocket Camera with the Metabones adapter and I believe PL lenses and big handheld rigs that they, they put on it. They had two cameras. They would not have used PL lenses if they're using the Metabones adapter. So let me describe that again. Would it be Canon lenses? Probably would have been Canon lenses, yeah. You know, I'll just let that slide. Could have been Nikon lenses. Could have been. I actually don't know what it is because sadly I arrived too late for Dan's <laughs> presentation. Well, maybe we could get so. Dan to come on here and talk about his experience with the Blackmagic Pocket Camera, the Metabones Adapter, and Canon and or Nikon lenses. I think that sounds great. We should definitely call him up and see when he's uh, next available. Oh, you know, what's one thing that's interesting that you brought me out to do was uh, a quick demo that we shot on the brand new Varicam. Mm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it restored my faith in Panasonic. It's pretty damn imp- impressive. Uh, we used a couple of them the other night on a... I don't know if I can say the commercial, but I'm going to say it anyway, because I think it'll be safe. It was a Tinder commercial. Oh, nice. <laughs> and uh, they had a couple of Victoria's Secret models who were out there on set. And uh, the Vericam, I will have to say, was amazing. Who it was, was shooting it? Uh, it was a gentleman named Colt Seaman from culprit creative and he is a real up-and-coming cinematographer forbes named him and his creative agency culprit uh like you know the 30 under 30 to watch so last year so yeah he's he's doing some some really big things right now he's i know he has pitch meetings all over town so he's moving and shaking good for him yeah so rod cameras client since 2011 nice yeah, so I have to say that like I was blown away by the Vericam's low light performance, and we were shooting um, without permits in Chinatown in downtown LA. Oh yes, with available light. Uh, you had you had one light that was like the size of an iPhone five. Yes, it was like a little LED that we could sometimes use to like get a little backlight or a little sum separation, but it wasn't you know it wasn't like a, you know we had a, a an eighteen K up there or anything like that. Not at all. We were getting our key light was often the size of a cell phone, and sometimes it was the size of a keychain light. And sometimes it was an actual cell phone. We used a we used an iPhone as a key light for one of the shots on uh, actress Rebecca Larson. It's really amazing what you can get out of the Vericam. The Vericam sees more photons more light than any camera i've ever used with less noise i mean it's possible you might be able to shoot of course you know these hundred thousand isos with other cameras but is that image actually usable i would argue that almost never would anyone consider the images that are coming out of these hundred thousand four hundred thousand these these crazy high isos as actually something that would be usable on any sort of screen that that you know above the size of your cell phone perhaps yeah yeah and the Vericam is amazing because it's got a 5,000 ISO mode that uh, literally like the smallest amount of lights, uh, the smallest type of light and will illuminate your subject. And so you have to then become comfortable and careful about your lighting ratios. What's dark, what's bright, what's, yeah, yeah. what's not. And so you can you can shoot in, I would not say total darkness if you want it to look good, but you can shoot in shots that you otherwise, you could shoot shots that you otherwise would have no chance of getting a proper yeah. exposure and a usable image from any other camera. Yeah, and I can honestly say, you know, like we've all taken like the Canon 5D or something and ramped it up to its highest ISO and looked at it and been like, wow, if that wasn't noisy as hell, I wish I could shoot like right now. And uh, this camera actually gives you that. And plus slow motion, plus a lot of things. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it's interesting because when you shoot in the 5000 ISO mode, you don't lose your 14 plus stops at dynamic range. Like it's wonderful to shoot in the high ISO modes like on a a Sony a7S, but you actually truncate and get less dynamic range when you start moving up in the ISO scale. And that doesn't happen with the Varicam. That's nice. Well, so are they. So when did that camera hit the street? It originally hit the street in any sort of meaningful way, like December last year. But I always think it takes about a year, a solid year for a a camera to sort of find its footing. So in the last, actually just in the last couple of weeks, a good friend of the show, Michael Cioni, I was talking to him. Nice. And he said that as he was going by his bays, the first something unusual happened is like they had done Vericam work before, but he walked past like three bays and everyone who was cutting in there or color correcting 
had shot on a Varicam. And he said that had not happened before. Where like literally all the bays were filled with Varicam. Oh, and we should also mention to uh, anyone listening, Varicam is 4K, correct? 4K, that's yeah. right. Yeah, not the original Varicam that came out in like, you know, uh, you know it's like 2000. 2000, yeah. yes, exactly. Uh, we're talking about the Varicam 35, which is a 4K camera with a Super 35 sensor and a PL lens mount and a bunch of other good things. And back in the day, I remember, uh, you know, there was sort of, you know, sort of like Apple versus PC. There was the Varicam crowd versus the Sony uh, F900 crowd. And I was always personally a much bigger advocate for the Varicam, even though it was technically lower resolution. I thought that uh, the color science was better. I thought the skin tones and everything looked way more film-like than than what uh, Sony created back then. You're not the only one. A lot of people felt that way. In fact, actually, I think it was IBC, I don't know, IBC maybe three years ago, last time I was there, I was on a panel with like Steve Weiss from Zakudo and these other people and someone brought up the Varicam and it became like this Varicam love fest of everyone, Dan Chung, everyone was saying like, oh my God, the Varicam is so amazing. And and I have to say that uh, there is something magical about the colors and when you were doing, I was involved in all these film out tests way back in the day with the CFI, which is a film lab, which is sadly no longer with us. Uh-huh. And uh, we were doing a lot of the all early testing. All the film testings. labs can rot in hell. I don't, I don't miss them at all. <laughs> Go on. Uh, we were doing a lot of testing uh, in, in the early days of transferring these digital high definition cameras and some standard definition cameras to 35 millimeter film and exploring the different processes and pros and cons of 720 versus 1080 and everything else. And the colors that you got from the Varicam, even after the transfer process to 35, were just, a, they were fantastic. They really had a lot of information. It was really a beautiful camera. Also, it was the first uh, HD camera or first video camera, frankly, that I ever remember that did multiple frame rates. So you can do slow motion in camera and maybe I'm incorrect. I've never articulated this out loud. I always assumed that the very in very cam was for variable speed. That is my understanding of where that comes from. Yes, it was a, it was the first camera to offer and I don't remember what it was on the low end, but it could go up to 60 frames. So yeah. you could do a 24, you could do a 48, you could do 60 and then in if you wanted the fast motion, I think it went down to like two frames or three frames a second. Something yeah, like that's something that was frankly not available on any other camera. And it was recording on tape. So that was it was kind of a weird trick to be able to pull that off in a, in a tape based world. That's right. It was. Uh, yeah. It was so the intro will, will be the love song to the Varicam. So welcome back, Varicam. <laughs> we missed you and I can't wait to work with you again. Uh, I actually really think the Varicam is going to become the camera of darkness, the camera of night, the well, camera you're talking of, my language, the, the camera, camera of, of shadows, the it camera is like, of darkness. It's it, not the camera we need. It's the camera we deserve. Well, I'll tell you, put bad ears on it. <laughs> that camera is going to find its way onto sets that I believe people are shooting uh, a dragon or they're shooting an Alexa because they want its incredible low light performance. And what's very interesting is, is that there may come a point where someone goes, you know what? We should just keep shooting on the, on the Varicam. And in talking to some of the other people out there right now, I think that day is happening sooner than we think. Sweet. Well, I would, I would definitely, you know, when I first looked at it, I'm like, well, it's a little big. And then after we messed around with it for a while, I was like, I was, we were shooting down an alley that had pretty much no light. And, and in fact, uh, the biggest problem was that there was like, Oh, like a light over a window or something like that, that was making everything look kind of flat. I remember you put like a, there was like a cardboard box on the ground that you just hung on the light and it, and it fixed the problem. And we were looking through the lens and, uh, and it just, I mean, it looked, it looked so cinematic just right out of the box. I can't wait for someone like, you know, Rodney Charters to play with this camera because uh, you and I used to get together on Monday nights to watch 24 and there was so many wonderful, you know, Rodney Charters when he was shooting that show had just had like these great shafts of light, all kinds of wonderful shadows. And that stuff that we were shooting in Chinatown without permits, you know, just running (laughs) around looked like something out of 24 and it it was, and it was the natural streetlight causing the shadows and that horrible sort of like, uh, over the over the window LED light that was built onto the side of this building. Once we covered that up, which was flattening out everything, all of a sudden now you had all this great dimensionality, yeah. and it was just a beautiful, beautiful scene. It really looked like something out of you know something out of a James Bond movie or something out of like yeah, a, a it was so much fun thriller. It, so. I don't know. I mean, it's like, there's some, there's there's nothing more fun than just doing like a really weird run and gun kind of shoot, and you realize what you can sometimes get away with. We should admit it, but we went into a bar and they just kind of gave us permission to kind of sit there and, you know, we, but we weren't bothering anybody. We didn't have a big setup. We didn't have any big lights. It was just, uh, you know, us and a camera and we got some just phenomenal looking, uh, 
uh, I, again, very cinematic looking stuff. It, it reminded me a little bit. I mean, it's been a few years now, but um, uh, Stu Meshwitz and Vincent LaFerre, when they got the when the Canon 1D uh, came out, they shot a thing called Nocturne entirely on the streets of L.A. at night with available light. And it was like it it, gave, it reminded me of that. But I think it looked a whole lot like better. Way higher quality. Yeah. Well, it's like the the colors were richer and it's because, you know, it's a, the, nothing against the Canon 1D. It's a great camera. But, you know, it, it, this is a camera that's built for cinema. Yeah. The 1D is a camera. I think now it retails for around six thousand or sixty five hundred dollars. Still. And, yeah. Same. And the Vericam is a fifty five thousand dollar camera. It's like, you know, there's obviously a major, major performance difference between between the two. But both cameras are very sensitive to, to low light. and You can get away with stuff you wouldn't necessarily, you know, Sony a7S, similar sort of thing. But again, you know, that's a that's a twenty five hundred dollar camera. I, uh, I just did a shoot on the a7S like three weeks ago so did i actually. Never, so. never used one before uh, uh, a7s is a cool camera and uh I, I like it a lot too it's um you know for a for the dslr the mirrorless dslr sort of hdslr crowd out there uh you can do a lot of low light stuff with it it's not in the same league as a varicam but it's still very impressive yeah 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 uh, we're, we're in interesting times I, I had lunch with somebody who just graduated from film school today hmm. and just moved out here and uh it was just interesting to talk to him because uh you know, he's he's of a generation that probably never. I think you were the one who said this. Never used tape, even like this guy. Yeah, he went he, to film school, but never used film and never used tape. Yeah, I mean, basically, he was talking about a project he shot on what he referred to as an ancient camera, and it was the Panasonic HVX two hundred. Yeah, ancient by way of two thousand five, so yeah. it is ten years ago. Yeah, it's crazy. And you know, here's something else just to put it in perspective. I would argue that like the GH four today, a fourteen hundred and ninety seven dollar camera is outperforming essentially all of the cameras of that like HVX 200 ilk from 10 years ago. In fact, I would say it's even outperforming like some of the higher end cinema cameras of 10 years ago. It's it's pretty amazing, like where we've gone. I mean, none of those cameras from 10 years ago were bad cameras and they didn't like start becoming bad cameras. It's just that technology has, you know, expanded and improved so yeah. much that we now get so much more with so little, which is amazing. Well, and even the GH4, you know, I complain about micro four thirds. It's not my favorite size sensor, but you know, George Lucas wished he had a micro four thirds size sensor to shoot the star Wars prequels. You know what? I, and I, I, I feel compelled to say that like, you know, there was a, the Zacuto test a few years ago where they put all the different cameras up and they showed it to a bunch of people. Uh, Francis Ford Coppola picked of all of the different cameras when he watched the thing that, you know, the GH two was his favorite look from them. So it's like you can do amazing things with your tool. Your tool is less important than the skill that you bring to it. But just saying that today's tools are so much more amazing and so much more capable than even the tools 10 years ago. And I didn't think that this is the type of like Moore's law of cameras that we were going to see this sort of changing, but you know, we're really there. In fact, we're getting to a point now where the differences between these sort of like lower end and mid end cameras, they may, they're, they're, going to be more about personal preference is it going to just start being about resolution you know like now you've got the dragon sensor at 6k and then you know are we going to have like 8k cameras and i think the manufacturers will want to play that game i think that consumers are smart and they're well i should say some consumers are very smart and some of the the people who and by consumers i mean people who would be buying these for professional use not consumer use but the consumers of these less expensive and mid-range products uh, are going to be looking at stuff like color and they're going to be looking at usability. Usability is a really is a really key thing because it doesn't matter if you've got a great camera. If you can't get done what you need to get done with it, then it's wasted yeah. on you. And there there is a there is a camera out right now that I that makes great images, but I I hate to throw it under the bus just because like usability, it's definitely throw it under something. the bus, throw the camera under the bus. The AJA Scion is a is a very capable camera, but it has usability issues, which does make it difficult then for, you know, most people out there to get what they want out of the camera. And, you know, that's that's not a big secret. Yeah, I will say that that was my experience with my one very brief experience with Scion. 
I've seen great dynamic range. There's people out there who say like, oh, it doesn't have any dynamic range. No, they're just not using it correctly. But using it correctly is not the way that most people want to work. And so I very much look forward to AJ's next effort. I think the next effort that they do might be amazing. I think that the current product that they have will still find a home amongst some people out there because it does yeah. offer a lot. Really, you know, uh, it's a it's a one it's a wonderful camera first out of the gate. But it does it, it takes you getting into the right mindset. You yeah. have to change the way that you work to work with that camera. And for some people, they're just not going to do it. It's the Final Cut Pro 10 of cameras. You know, there are people who love Final Cut Pro 10. I was talking to a guy today and he was going on and on about how Final Cut Pro 10 is just like, you know, rocked his world. And I know you don't like it, but I know that it's not just me. It's not just you. It's, it's true. But it's it's the body of almost anyone who's ever had to spend a day editing professionally. I'm sure that there's, <laughs> you know, the people who like who like I'm going to I'm going to go out on a limb here and say the people who like Final Cut 10, they're the climate science deniers of editing. <laughs> you know what? Uh, our previous guest, David Leitner, would disagree with you. He would. He and would. we should bring him back on I, and have the great Final Cut. Pro- Honestly, Michael Cioni was probably him and David Leitner are the only two people who have articulated pro Final Cut 10 uh, issues. But again, we're not the editing podcast. We're the cinematography podcast. That's right. So uh, but there, it's all related. There's, you know, color, you know, we're not the color correction podcast. But we talk about that sometimes. And that's we're, not true. The, we're not the lighting podcast, but that's very much a part of cinematography. So, okay. so, you know, I, so I think I'll all just, of this I'll just leave is it at is fair Final Cut 10 is a piece of shit. And that's a fact. <laughs> Uh, you've basically <laughs> assured us of never being sponsored by Apple. Thank you very much. That's okay, but I'm, but maybe maybe Adobe will come on board. <laughs> um, if anyone's listening, we actually don't have any sponsors right now, except for Hot Rod Cameras, where you should be buying all of your stuff. Exactly. So our guest today is Mike Mickens. Now, Mike has got a very accomplished body of work. The guy's made like 30 features. He's he shot really has. 30 features. He shoots television. I know he shoots, uh, you know, cable series for, for many different networks, but you talk to Mike about Leprechaun in the hood. I did talk to him about lip in the hood. It was, it was, uh, it, I mean like, look, man, I, I, it's not that I ironically like Leprechaun in the hood. You legitimately seriously like it. Uh, it's, it's entertaining in the way that it's designed to be entertaining. Okay. Let me put it that way. And it's, uh, you know, I think that it's a really interesting, super low budget movie shot entirely at Lacey Street Studios in downtown L.A. Also made famous by like the Saw movies and a thousand just, just, others. just the first Saw movie. Oh, the, the Saw movie. The, Sorry, the, first. The, the first Saw was shot there entirely. And then after that, they someone did might argue the, the best Saw movie. I would argue the best Saw movie, and I've seen several of them. Mike, Mike comes across as a very uh, youthful guy. And then you realize he's been around for decades doing, you know, really solid, solid work. Uh, starting with Roger Corman going to, you know, up to television today. The thing about Mike, and I think this comes across really well in the interview, is that he's one of the nicest people you've ever met. And Truly. I, and I will say that, like, on set, he's not laid back and relaxed like he's not paying attention and things aren't going on. He is totally engaged in with what's happening. But it is such a pleasure to work with someone who is so confident in what it is that they are doing and so knows their craft so inside and out that there is no doubt and there is no drama. The guy's amazing. So uh, without further ado, Mike Mickens. Mike Mickens. The Cinematography Podcast Interview. All right, I'm here at Hot Rod Cameras in Hollywood, California with DP extraordinaire Mike Mickens. How are you doing today, Mike? Good. How are you doing? I am doing awesome awesome uh well you were just saying something a minute or two ago about how you just watched one of your movies through for the first time in like 20 years or something uh it was called under oath under oath yes which i have on dvd so under oath is a movie that you made that you shot 20 years ago uh let's see it was released in 1997 so i probably shot it in 96 i would think so 18 years ago and the worst thing about that is that 1996 was 18 years ago that's probably the worst part, yeah. That's pretty pretty horrible. Yeah. Probably uh, if anyone is a student listening to this, they weren't born yet. Yeah. Um, yeah, boy. The, uh, but kind of a, one of my favorite movies I ever shot, actually. What about it made it one of the mo- one of your favorite movies you ever shot? What's, what specifically? Um, because uh, I got to really sit down with the director and come up with a look and the production designer all in the same room. Mm-hmm. We're all on the same page <clears throat> for the, for the entire movie. We, kind of set a look before we even started uh-huh. that there would be only certain colors on the set it was almost like we were going for a black and white movie but we weren't allowed to shoot a black and white movie because it was roger corman everything had to be shot in color 
um so we kind of went for um uh we went for a brown tone so it was a brown and white movie (laughs) (laughs) so basically i mean people the set dresser would be like oh my god there's a piece of blue in the background somewhere and would find little you know like a blue sheet up on a on a bulletin board and pull it off immediately hilarious you know only white or brown was allowed on the set or we had grays and you know certain colors like that but so okay um, so i want to go back and and just start with i mean we can start even before this with your education that brought you into uh, cinematography in the first place i have no education in cinematography you have no education so so how do you go from no education in cinematography to shooting you know features and stuff like that um uh lucky no um the um i have a background in um film production Mm -hmm. television film production at syracuse university newhouse school i went to school with um some really really smart people and had some really good professors um but it it was more of a general education i mean you know um not specifically hard i mean 25 percent of your load was making movies and Mm -hmm. television shows so we kind of learned how to do that but uh, we were kind of more trained to be producers in that school. It's not a it's not a school that makes technicians, which I consider a cinematographer kind of a technical, a technician, right? So um, it was good to have that background in production. So you kind of know where when you do talk to a producer about a set. And it's good to have to know what their brain's going through at the time. So yeah, I can I can speak to a producer pretty easily and know kind of. I started out in uh, probably my first. A gig out of college was working as a production coordinator at MTV. Oh, really? Yeah. So what, what's that, going on at MTV around this time? Uh, let's see, 80s, early 80s. Uh, I believe it was before Viacom bought them out. So this is like early days of MTV. Yeah. Yeah. This is uh, Randy of the Redwoods. And, you know, I was hired by my teaching assistant from college, who was the production manager there, and who I always thought he did not like me. <laughs> because I, I would make him mount cameras up in the ceiling and do crazy things like that because we we're doing different projects. And I always kind of drove him a little nuts. So I always thought, oh, he's never going to like me, whatever. Cause, and he actually gave me a job right out of college. So Nice. And uh, so I worked there in basically film. What was it called? Uh, it was promotions. So we did like the little wraparounds. You know, it was Randy of the Redwoods and all these little goofy, weird I vaguely, it's like a vague yeah, memory probably. of a you're, dream. You're, young. you're a little younger. I'm not that, that young. <laughs> well, you are. I have terrible news for you, but I'm well, in my yeah. 40s, so, so I have officially crossed that Rubicon. Okay. Um, you don't have an AARP card. So. <laughs> not not yet, no. Mm-hmm. Okay, so so you're at MTV. How long are you there, and how do you end up at, at Corman? Because to me, like that, Corman is like a mythical place around the time that you're there. Uh, well, MTV's in New York. And I grew up uh, in New York area. I started working uh, somewhere along the line, working as a PA and a production coordinator, a boom operator, a electrician. I kind of said, uh, this is, I knew a lot of crew. Being a coordinator, you got to hire a lot of people. So it was kind of good. I can get onto a lot of different crews. So I kind of yeah. cruised around for a little bit. And then I kind of focused on learning about lighting. I decided I was going to be a DP. I figured that's a good way because my brain was set up as a kind of grew up as a a house full of artists. So Mm -hmm. I kind of, my mom's an artist, my brother's an artist. We were all kind of painters or, you know, working in the visual arts. So that was where my brain was. I took art classes growing up. So I kind of knew composition and I kind of learned a lot of things about just seeing things, how to learn to see basically. I think that's the most important part of being cinematography is kind of learning how to see things. So at somewhere in those early years, I decided I was going to, I wanted to focus on cinematography Mm -hmm. and, um, I knew nothing about light other than what I could see in a picture, but I didn't know how to create it, you know? So the guys who uh, created the light, you kind of have, so if you work around electricians, you're going to pick up a few things. So if you work around cinematographers who know what they're doing, you can kind of, you know, basically steal because that's the best way to learn yeah you, you learn and then you can steal their ideas so why not i mean that's part of cinematography i mean you, um, you know but also you create your own ideas but you want to you, you kind of have to start from somewhere so yeah yeah this is a good trick i should learn that i should keep that in my little 
So did you work? You worked as an electrician? Yeah, I've got to work for like Haskell Wexler and oh, people wow. like that. You know, so it was kind of cool. You know, he would come in. It was mostly commercials in New York. That's that was your bread and butter. So you got to you got to work with some people who come in from L.A. and be like, oh, I'm on the crew, and you know, and you slept some cables around. But you got to actually see cinematographers that you totally respect and you kind of like are legends. Okay, so so you're in New York. It's a small market, and you want to be a cinematographer. You have to wait until you're like 60s to get a break, right? <laughs> so you go almost there, man. Almost yeah, there now, right? So you go. Uh, I'm gonna move to Los Angeles, and actually, a friend of mine had already moved to Los Angeles, Liam, mm-hmm. who you know. And uh, I decided that I that would be move across Le- the Liam Finn, the yes. founder of uh, Filmmakers Alliance. That's correct, right? And who I've known since kindergarten. Wow, yeah, pretty long time. And then, um, so I decided to make the move, and I had done years ago, just kind of getting my brain, and you know, <laughs> it takes a little while to get out there and save some money up and stuff like that. So I moved across country and uh, had a few connections. So I got some uh, days as an electrician working for shows like The Flash and some studio stuff like that. And I was mm-hmm. building up my days to get into the local 728 because it's a good way you can work with, you know, I got to work with Roy Wagner and people like that. And you Sweet. get to work with huge talents out here. It's totally a different world. You're like, oh, wow, your eyes just kind of. Well, and I'm sure it's a different world now. Obviously, it's completely mm-hmm. different than it was when you moved out here. But do you think it's easier to rise to the to the top? Is there more opportunity in Los Angeles than there was in New York at the time? Definitely at the time, yeah. Mm-hmm. This would be late 80s, early 90s. Gotcha. Time. So, um, yeah, there's there, it's just a bigger market at the time. New York was so small compared to Los Angeles at the time. Los Angeles was the it still is the center of the world and you know, yeah. making movies and television, things like that. It's changing a lot, but still, I mean, as we see that, you know, that's part of uh, my career being here, <laughs> learning things that are changing a lot. The best way was uh, I kind of lucked out and got to work on Roger Corman movies. I kind of went down there. I just kind of knocked on the door and said, hi, I'm Mike and talked to uh, Mike Elliott mm-hmm. and I got to talk to Roger Corman and he was very approachable. Like so. he, he was like there working the yeah. premises. Uh, yeah. He, you could come down and, uh, was, but was this basically when they, when they were down on, this on is Vulture? on, yeah. On, uh, in Venice on, um, Oh, on, uh, cross from the clown. When I Venice. first moved to LA, they were on Wilshire, but it was like the end of when, of Concord studios, mm-hmm. my wife worked at the Concord building and I sort of geeked out on the fact that, okay, it's like, wow, this is Roger Corman's building. Holy shit. Right. Well, he had his offices there yeah. in, the, in the nice little, in Brentwood. Uh, okay. That he had for years. That was there for years. So, like, that was his main office. He would come down to the stages, <laughs> you know. He would grace his present. Always, every feature that you did, or he would always come down. That's and cool. And kind of, like, say, hey, who are you? And he would know kind of, like, about you and stuff, which was kind of neat. I've always heard he was a pretty nice guy. Yeah, yeah. Very, uh, very frugal, which was fantastic. He just knew how to make movies, you know, and he, he just knew you hire people and they'll work their butts off. And, you know, he kind of like just had the certain presence about him. It was just you got inside the machine. You just started working and working and working. Uh-huh. So basically, I kind of went down there as a as a gaffer because I started in New York and did a lot of gaffing and then came out here. I was gaffing some stuff and some bigger stuff. I was working for uh, a bigger director, DP, Tony K at the time. Kind of cool stuff like that. Yeah. And, uh, but I needed to kind of make that jump. You know, you have to like commit yourself to being a cinematographer, you know, and stop taking jobs as, you know, that you're paying your rent with. Yep. <clears throat> and, uh, and go, okay, I'm going to make that jump. I tell a lot of people in the business, like, you know, there's a certain point where you have to stop being a focus puller or stop being a, you know, just an operator and stuff like that. Yeah. So I basically said, okay, I'm a gaffer. Give me a job as a gaffer and, and just let me, shoot something like a second unit or something like that. So, uh, I said I, I could do like five of them. He didn't pay very well. So you're kind of like, you know, you're financially on edge at that point. So you're kind of like, okay, let me do a couple of your movies and then you let me get and shoot something for you like second unit, which was cool. So I, was, I did uh, a bunch of, um, movies. I think the blood fist movies and stuff like, nice. well, what did we do first? We did, uh, <laughs> unborn Two. I worked as a gaffer on unborn Two. There were a lot of, unanswered questions from un, unborn one so i'm glad you did <laughs> so, that 
<laughs> I did a movie with... Uh, and these are second unit jobs? Your second unit DP on this? Uh, no, I was a gaffer on, let's say, Revenge of the Red Baron. And that was with uh, Mickey Rooney, which is kind of cool. Mickey Rooney? Yeah. Nice. The Mickey Rooney. And he was working for Corman. He was working for Corman. Yeah, because that's at Corman, surprising. you caught everyone on their way up or their way down. Yeah, yeah. So that was kind of like, you know. But uh, Mickey was an interesting guy, I got to say. Had a lot of good stories about... Uh, you know kind of growing up in the industry and stuff like that jesus so. i bet he would yeah so um <clears throat> for another longer episode <laughs> and then uh the uh so i think my first second unit gig was probably one of the blood fist things manhunt <laughs> manhunt <laughs> manhunt um nice so i guess i did a good job so um they decided to hire me on some other things and there was like always something going on at corman they're always like okay we need a um, you shoot some scenes from this, you know, exploitation movie that we bought half of and still half yeah, the movie yeah. has to be shot, you know. And uh, so you always had the interesting little projects that'd be like, okay, it's this and you got to shoot this. And, you know, you have no resources and figure it out. <laughs> but you do have a 35 millimeter camera. Yeah, yeah. And here's a couple lights and or maybe no lights or whatever, but go figure it out. Is there anything like Corman around today? <sighs> I don't know. You know, that's, I kind of wonder because, I mean, how do you gain that experience? I mean, because, you know, once you do a good job, I mean, second unit involved, okay, you're going to go out today and uh, you're going to have a big gunfight in the street with automatic weapons and get all this footage. It's day exterior, so you don't need any lights. Just go out and shoot this. And then you're going to blow the car up and roll it. And then there's a full body burn. Nice. before lunch. Oh boy! So you're like uh, really okay, like would, would it be, how can I do? That? Would it seriously be like that? Yeah, that much stuff before lunch. Yeah. You'd be like, that's crazy. Yeah, you did more before nine a.m. than you're the you know, you're the Marines. Features, you do. <laughs> it's like the Marines, but you learned really fast how, uh-huh. to, how to think on your feet and just kind of like, oh, uh, how how do I wear you know? And you you talk with some really good stunt people like you know, and I would just be like, where's the best place I could put the camera where it's not going to be destroyed. You know, give me, you know, because these guys are all very experienced stunt people and be like, okay, put the camera right here. The car will just like get within an inch of the camera. You so know, I get, I get with the movie stars, here. but how do they get super experienced stunt people and stuff like that? Um, if because not he was well? really smart. He always had really safe, he put safe people there. But would he pay the stunt people or whatever better than he paid everybody else? Or? Um, That was always, uh, we don't know. Okay. Probably did, you know, because um, they didn't work all the time. Yeah. So, you know, they come in for a day and say, okay, we're going to do this, this, and this. And we, you load it up. So all your stunts would be like done. That's probably why he did it. He probably paid full rate and then uh, you had to yeah. get them all done at once. Yeah. I did second unit on a, on a thing I've talked about on here a little bit called chosen. Uh, that mm-hmm. was a series for crackle and I shot, I directed second unit for uh-huh. season three and, uh, it was like that. It was like, we had one day of special effects yeah. and we had to do all the special effects for the whole season in one day. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, television like that now. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, we're going to load everything up on this one thing. I'm sure that this answer would fill nine podcasts, but like, what are some of the lessons that you learned while you were working for Corman that still pervade your work today? Um, be efficient. Um, be fast, be efficient and kind of pre-think and try to be three or four steps ahead of the, the director mm-hmm. and everyone else. I mean, know that, okay, I'm, we're going to shoot this and we're going to turn around really quick and we're going to shoot this and then we're going to turn around and shoot this really quick yeah and have your gaffer working on the next thing and you know give them your notes so everybody you're always kind of two steps ahead uh-huh. so when you walk on and i i've actually i remember one movie where the sets weren't built yet but i was putting up lighting how, how <laughs> it was does that a space work? movie and i knew that was there was gonna be someone in a corner on a bed <laughs> it was a two-walled set but oh, i had nice. the lights up before they built the set crazy just you just had to be that fast i mean but it's good because then it teaches you to be very quick you know, mm-hmm. and to pre-think things and actually visualize in your mind what it's going to look like. So that's kind of the experience and you learn and learn and learn and learn and you just have so many opportunities to learn. How many days when you were working for Corman, how many days would they have to shoot a whole feature? Uh, features, the ones with the big budgets, which were between seven fifty and a million dollars. Mm-hmm. Those are the big budget ones. They were usually 20 days, mm-hmm. 18 to 20 days. So that was, that was um, actually a luxury if you had 20 days to shoot mm-hmm. What, and they weren't what about like, on the far other end? It wasn't two people talking. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it was going to be, you know, there's a gunfight and someone catches on fire and there's a plane crash and this, you yeah, know, they're, they're generally and you do it in 18 days. Some kind of exploitation film. There's yeah. some kind of yeah. horror thriller. Right. right. 
So there's always, you know, you and they build in, you know, they're very good about scheduling things and, mm-hmm. you know, using their being efficient. So, so you kind of have to learn to be really fast about things. So was there like a college kind of an atmosphere? Like, like the people you went through that with, are they like college buddies? The people you still talk to? Oh God. Yeah. Yeah. These are all these people that I, I work in the industry now. Most of them, a lot of them came from Corman. Really? Yeah. And, uh, it's amazing if you really look at people's credits who do all the big movies and, it's they're all the working Corman people so we interesting kinda, we kind of all went through and learned a lot of stuff together so I guess you can call it a college uh, <laughs> you know it's amazing I mean like Wally Pfister was there before me oh I didn't know that and that's how my buddy Corey Garriak he was a buddy of mine and that we were friends I worked on his crew as an electrician and and he's gaff for me when I shot and he's worked on Reeker he's oh, yeah. he did second unit cinematography for me uh, but he does uh, movies for Wally Fister for 14 years. So he's oh, his gaffer. So, so he's, he's done every right. Batman and, you know. Yeah, every Christopher Nolan movie, basically. Yeah, yeah. So his credit list is pretty big. So Nice. Uh, it, but these are these are the buddies that you kind of, you went to war with. Well, what you I, know. The, the impression that I always got from Corman stuff, having never, like, by the time I got to L.A., that wasn't happening here anymore. Mm-hmm. I got when did here, you get to L.A.? I got here in, like, 99. Oh, okay. So okay. I think it was one. Yeah. I mean, like he's still making movies. He he, mm-hmm. he he made two Sharktopus movies fairly recently. Hey, I watched Sharktopus two and and noted uh, that uh, it really went downhill since Sharktopus one. Oh, I thought really? Sharktopus one was a lot better than Sharktopus two. One of my favorites. Yeah, it's very good. But <laughs> but um, I I always got the impression with Corman because there are companies they will remain nameless, but there are companies out here who churn out a lot of like straight to video or straight mm-hmm. to VOD kind of material. Yeah. yeah. But it's almost like they've made a commitment to not good quality work. Right. Whereas Corman, it seemed like he was getting. I mean, it, you look at the directors that came out of Corman, like Scorsese mm-hmm. and Francis Ford Coppola and Woody Allen and like all, all uh, John Sayles, Joe Dante. Yeah. There's uh and obviously James Cameron. And, you know, he was he was giving people opportunities to make exploitation movies, low budget movies. Mm -hmm. But it seemed like he was trying to get quality people to do it. Right. And giving them the license to do it well, if that could be done in the amount of time that they had. Oh, God. Yeah. And production designers and like Dave Bless. He's another guy who came out of Corman. These are these are the people that come out and he he does Justified. Yeah. All these big shows now. Great, great production designer, you know, that you. I mean, you hone your craft there. I mean, he gives you the opportunity to hone your craft and make mistakes. Mm-hmm. And that that's the nice part. And nobody comes down and says, oh, you made a mistake on this or whatever. You know, it's always you kind of rolled with it and you worked yeah, things yeah. in. So, but you, he, of course, gave you enough rope to, to hang yourself. <laughs> um, no, but like, you but know. he was, I think he was harder on the directors. You really? Know? He, he, um, he had a different take on, on directing, so. He always thought it was very easy, I think. Well, he himself is a director. Yeah. So he just thought it was an easier job. He paid the directors a lot less than anyone else on the crew. So Not which surprising. Which is always kind of interesting. So, But the amount of people and talent at that time there, I mean, it was pretty amazing if you're, I really think back on it. Uh, I met I met um, a director, a friend of mine, who I've done a lot of movies with, Dave Payne. Mm-hmm. And he was a craft service guy, right? On, uh-huh. on a movie I was shooting and... I can't even remember the name of the movie, uh-huh. but he was very kind of a funny guy. And then I would, you know, at the time I smoked and I would go outside and smoke and talk to him and, you know, we'd be finishing lighting up a scene or something and, or had a break or something like that. And I would sit there and talk with him. I thought he was a fascinating guy. He's great. And he's yeah. doing craft service. He's, you know, one day he's just like, uh, I got Roger to green light this script I wrote. Oh really? And it was using existing sets <laughs> that were there. <laughs> And he basically sat down and he wrote this entire script that fit into all these sets and said, why don't you shoot it? We have nine days to shoot it. It has to be on the weekends. I was like, okay, <laughs> let's do it. So I think we did it over a couple of weekends. You know, while the other crew would just finish up, we'd come in and uh-huh. get the gear and we'd just shoot our own little version of the movie. It's kind of funny. So. Wow. What, and what has he gone on to direct? Well, we did the Reeker series. Oh, yeah, of course. He's done uh, Reeker, No Man's Land, Adam's Family Reunion, just can't get enough. Uh, he did episodes of Super Ninjas, which I shot. He did episodes of Fred the Show, which I've shot. We have a very parallel career. Um, uh, Alien Avengers Two, which is very funny. That uh, was uh, who would make something with such a buffoonish title? That was a Corman movie. Sorry, uh, I made a movie called Alien Raiders. 
the movie we did was Alien Terminator, I think it was called. Alien Terminator. Yes, another alien. There's a lot of alien in the Alien movies. Terminator. It's like of, it's like we're crossing the streams of James Cameron. Exactly. And we also did Under Oath together, which is one of my favorite movies we ever did. Um, alien Avengers 2, which <laughs> was starring Uh-oh. someone. Uh, Say Dana George Plato. George Went and Julie Brown. Oh, wow. And oddly enough, Julie Brown is now the head writer on the TV show that I shoot right now called 100 Things to Do in High School for Nickelodeon. Oh, sweet. Which I just started two weeks ago, so. Did she remember you? Uh, yeah. Oh, cool. That's kind of funny, so. Um, so all these people, it comes around. It's a very small world sometimes. So how long were you working for Corman? I think the last thing I did for Corman was uh, a TV series called uh, Black Scorpion. Oh, I remember and Black I Scorpion. I finished that up, and my last thing I ever did, I directed for him. So, so Black. So, how many years would you say you were there for? <sighs> when was Black Scorpion? Ninety nine, maybe. So, like eight years. Uh, yeah, but I did other things too. Yeah. So, so on and off, like you, living, you, so. you 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 were working for Corman though for a long time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, but I also during that time period, I, I did original gangsters as a gaffer. Uh huh. With my buddy Carlos Gonzalez, he's a DP. I know Carlos. Yeah. Okay. Holy shit! When I started out, that's, I was working for. That's who I was supposed to have drinks with later, but. Oh it's really? Five a.m. call. So. I need to fucking see Carlos. I haven't okay. seen him since I've lived in L.A. The first movie I ever worked on uh, was for a guy in Alabama named David Pryor, uh, called Raw Justice, and okay. Carlos was the DP on that. Okay. And uh, who and was he, the producer? Was that uh, David Winters? Okay. Oh, uh, the star of that was well, it was Robert Fred Hayes, Williamson? Robert Hayes, David Keith. Okay. And uh, brand new Pamela Anderson. Pamela, oh, it was really? the, it, it, she hadn't. Uh, she was. I, I didn't. I had no idea who the hell she was. Uh-huh. Uh, she was the Tool Time Girl, and I didn't watch uh, Home okay. Improvement. And I don't right. think it, this is nineteen ninety three. Yeah, I don't think Baywatch was a thing yet. Yeah, or if it was, it wasn't a hit yet. Right. So, um, right, right. so I just thought she was some actress, and then uh, yeah, and then somebody, uh, somebody, I, I would say kind of crossed the line and like the day the day after she finished brought all of her playboys to the set to show everybody uh and i was like oh what yeah but um but yeah so but carlos shot that and then the next movie i worked for i worked the all the first movies i was i was a makeup artist Uh and all the early movies i worked on for uh were for david Pryor. um they were all they shot everything in mobile alabama sometimes they Uh they uh, like uh, Raw Justice, when I got there, they were shooting in New Orleans. They would shoot for like two weeks in New Orleans and then go back to Mobile mm-hmm. where David could close down the uh, courthouse on a Friday afternoon right. so he could shoot there. Right. Like he just had the town on the town, uh, town nice. wired. And uh, and but Carlos shot that. He shot mm-hmm. a movie called uh, that was originally called um, Bioforce One, but was released as Mutant Species. Oh, wait, I got to look that up. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That okay. that has one of my favorite lines from a movie. I'm not to make this about me, but okay. uh, that has one of my favorite lines from a movie where it's like this: uh, the um, Ted Pryor, David's brother, uh-huh. uh, was playing this special forces guy who's who uh, one of the people in his platoon has been infected with this bio agent that turns him into a monster, Le- okay. Leo Rossi. Okay, and um, and and like these uh, para rescue guys or something are, are dropped into the area, and he mm-hmm. gets in, one of them gets into an argument with Ted Pryor's character at one point and grabs him, and, and I think it's one of my favorite lines in any movie I've ever worked on. He grabs him and he says like, close enough to kiss. He's like, "You special forces guys are always more mouth than ass." <laughs> and even when we were shooting it, I'm like, "That's um, hmm, that's an interesting turn of phrase right there. Always more mouth than ass." I like thinking about mouth and ass in the same oh, God. sentence. Well, let me ask you, do you hit a point at Corman where, um, where you realize like, okay, I, I need to move on from yeah. this. Like I, yeah, I don't, you do. I, and, and so, uh, like what was that moment? Were you on set? Did, was there, was it, or was it just a general feeling that you had? Like, uh, okay, I've done enough of this. Yeah. Um, well I did projects outside of Corman too. So mm-hmm. I worked all around. I mean, I, kept a pretty steady diet of working the there is a certain point where you just have to move on yeah yeah the um i was working on a tv series called black scorpion which we were talking about and yeah. um i had the opportunity they let me actually direct an episode because that was part of my I'm like I, mm-hmm. yeah let me do one right <laughs> so and they did and um uh as soon as i did i kind of left <laughs> <laughs> i got mine buddy um, I'm out of here. Um, no, I was offered a second unit DP job on a, a pretty big feature called Made Men with um, James Belushi. Uh-huh. 
So it was uh, about a $10 million feature. George Meridian was the DP on that. He mm-hmm. asked me to come on. You know, I was recommended by Corman people. The, uh, the director was a ex Corman guy. Nice. And at that point I actually had to join the union cause that was a union gig and Corman was non-union. So, yeah. but I had all my days. You'd, it was a hundred days. You had to have a experience. I'm sure you had a lot more than that. And, yeah. And, uh, I joined the union and, um, went to do second unit. It was great. And, uh, got to do blow up stuff and. It was one of those movies. It was a guy on the run from the mafia and, yeah, yeah. and Utah. And it was nice to get uh, paid well. And uh, it was kind of a fun movie to work on. So um, it was in Provo, Utah. Not the most exciting place in the world. Yeah. But definitely interesting when a, a film crew <laughs> comes to town. So, But it was kind of, it was a great experience. And then uh, I kind of moved on from there at that point. So mm-hmm. I needed to move on from there. So. Um, I, I don't think there was one blinding moment of like, you gotta go. Yeah. <laughs> you know, I think you just like you, other opportunities it was just, yourself that are, are better for you. It was just your time. It was yeah. time, time to move yeah. on to yeah. get to be- better stuff. Yeah. It's kind of neat. Let's, let's talk a little bit about craft and, uh, I'm, I'm going to, uh, use the same question I've been using on everyone. A few people have challenged the validity of this question, which is fine. Okay. Uh, but the question that I that I start with, um, I realized at some point that some DPs is it composition or lighting? Exactly. See, you, I did listen to your you, podcast. Oh, you listened to it. You're the first one ever. <laughs> well, I thought I'd understand what. So, you're so, about. so, do you start? Do you start with the idea of how you're going to light it? Are Are you more excited about lighting it? Or are you more excited about composing the actual shot? Um. Well, I think it's not a valid question. You think it's not a valid question? I don't think it's a valid question. I think it's both of these things are very important. Mm-hmm. You're also, uh, when you're working on television, you, I'm working with operators who are also working with a director to compose the image. You know, that's part of it. Yeah. You know, so on a feature, it's a different kind of, you're more intimate with the director. I guess that's the you relationship know, I'm talking about. And television, you're you're leaving when, a lot of your composition up to your... But you do a lot of both, right? You do, yeah. You you yeah. do you do features and you do TV, yeah. And I understand but mostly what, TV because that's what is in town nowadays. So that's true. And try to stay around, and not be a migrant film worker. <laughs> so. Mm-hmm. so okay, well, I think that that's worth talking about then. So when you're working with a director on like a feature, mm-hmm. and it's like you and the director and a production designer, you yeah. know, whatever, and the design team coming up with the look and right. how you're going to execute the look. Are you thinking more about composition? Are you talking to the director more about composition or are you? Oh, mostly? absolutely. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. I mean, it's so important that, uh, there's, there are movies like when I work with Dave Payne, I'll actually sit down and draw out every frame mm-hmm. just like a pre especially if it's a very complex scene where, you know, someone is, something's happening. It's very complex action. I will sit down, draw it out every single shot. And we'll basically sign off on the shots. Mm-hmm. You know, there's there's one scene where uh, a girl is murdered in a in an outhouse, a very small outhouse. So, As you do, of course, doesn't yeah. always happen. It's in uh, Reeker. It's a very scary yes. scene, actually. I love and, Reeker. Uh, I think Reeker's a really good film. Yeah, and so it's when she gets the toilet paper, and we mm-hmm. came up with this entire thing, and I drew out every single frame. Yeah. So I knew exactly where the camera was going to be for each beat of the action, and there's a lot of beats. I mean, there's yeah. so many beats. We actually took about half a day to shoot that scene, or almost close to three quarters of a day shooting that scene which is so intense there's so many different angles there's so many beats in the action that's yeah. just, just like bink 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 um that had to be hit but i basically charter it out you know so i have a big list here i'm like okay we need to get this shot next and this is this beat when she starts to scream and this is here and you have to and we sit down before him like weeks before so i in my head i've already lit it seen what the scene is i know what i only need two walls for the mm-hmm. shot you know i can take off this wall to put the camera in and all this is all pre-done in my head. So it's when it comes to you're there, it's like, okay, it's A, B, C, D. You're going to go like this. You're going to think it, rethink it, yeah, and go through it. I mean, uh, I kind of do it all in my head now a lot of times. Yeah. I mean, I had to do a uh, thing for uh, The New Normal for NBC, that show. I was working on New Normal, second unit DP. Okay. Um, the, uh, the scene they threw over from first unit was so complex uh, it was a scene where Nene Leakes is going to play herself, her mother, her father, uh, in the scene where and sitting there at the table with her brother. Mm-hmm. So it's basically a flashback that she goes through, but she has to play every part. And to do that, you have to have photo doubles. And yeah, you know, first you just didn't have the time to do it. So they said, "Here, do this for us." So, <laughs> so uh-huh. 
I came in and just basically pre the whole thing in my head. And I sat down and I said, okay, uh, we need this shot of her over her dad and for, and sat down with the script and said, okay, you got to do this, this, this. And do and they have this. a second unit director on that as well? Yeah. It was actually the first unit director came on. It was, oh, so uh, it was the main Max, guy. Max Winkler. Okay. So it was the main director was coming in, yeah. but, second, but they needed a second unit. They were, were they running two units at the same time or what? No, I think they just had thrown this off their schedule and, and I picked it up. Oh, okay. So they said, here, we're got not going to be able to do this in a, you know. The time period that we need I, to actually do this because of the the makeup and wardrobe changes yeah. and everything else, and so I sat down and just said, "Okay, this is where you have to shoot everything this way, so I don't have to relight everything six times." You know, so yeah, yeah. You, you go around the table, you're taking walls out and you're relighting and everything. So, uh, so I came up with a battle plan, and it, from it was easier. They loved me because I just came up. I said, "Okay, this is there are eight essential shots that we have to get." And then everything else is gravy because the scene will work on, with these eight shots. And the director basically wanted, I think, about 28 different shots. Good Lord. So, yeah. It's, and it's a three minute scene. Okay. So you'd be like cutting every yeah, second like, and a half. Beep, 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 right. Yeah. Um, so, but we actually, I think we wound up doing about 32 different shots. Really? For it. Yeah. And she's in. When you're saying 32, she's is in, it's like a wide and a tight of the same lighting? Uh, no. No, yeah, so actually it was like, different angles and lighting stuff. Good, probably. Lord. Well, maybe a couple were closer versions of, of a wider shot. When yeah. I th- when I think of second unit, I always think of um, when I was when I was hired to do shows, and I called the only second unit director I'd ever known, um, a guy named Todd Hallowell, who does Ron Howard's second unit. Uh huh. And uh, he said that on Apollo 13, he made up T-shirts for the second unit crew that said, "If it was easy, first unit would have done it." Right. It's true. <laughs> and it's like, yeah, like you know, they they're gonna throw you the stuff that's like time consuming or mm-hmm. or you know very mission critical and has to be done a bunch of times or yeah whatever you know but it's kind of nice because it's a great challenge that somebody said okay he can handle it just do this and figure yeah. it out and, and it's great because you actually have time to sit down and think about it beforehand and all right we're gonna take this and this and this yeah, and, yeah. you know where they were just kind of overwhelmed from person you, you couldn't really do it i mean it was, they just didn't have the time to do it so so, uh, so to kind of get back a little bit to my question, uh, you're, you're saying that my question isn't valid when it comes to television, where the director is often talking straight to the camera operator. Like the DP is basically in charge of figuring out the lighting and the operator is more of a, of the composition guy. Well, even on features, I mean, that's part of the, mm-hmm. I mean, I know what's going on and, and will suggest things, but you're moving so quick, especially when you're doing children's television you're so limited by hours. I mean, when I'm doing a uh, uh, hundred things right now, we're, we have to knock these things out in a couple hours. I mean, yeah, these kids are on a limited time scale. They have to go to school all day and then, you know, come out for, you know, 20 minutes here and shoot this angle and then yeah. turn around and we got to do this. So going further into craft, um, yeah. I, I'm always interested in hearing from, a, from various DPs, you know, you're given a script, you read the script uh, you start coming up with ideas or the director gives you some ideas, but, um, about how you're going to visually translate the script, mm-hmm. like in terms of, you know, focal length, in terms of how you're going to light it, in terms of how you're going to move the camera. Is it handheld? Is it steady cam? Is it dolly? Is it this? Is it that? Uh-huh. Um, if you were able to put your process into words, and I know a lot of people don't put their process into words, but if you're able to put your process into words, if I, if you were given a script, uh-huh. what, what goes through your head while you're reading the script, even if like the director's given you like no, has has given you no idea of what how they want to attack it yet? Well, uh, the first time I read a script, I read it for entertainment value to actually see if the story works. Yeah. Right. And probably the second time I read it, it'll be like that too. And then uh, probably the third time I read it, then I start to come up with ideas. Mm-hmm. But even before usually before I even meet a director on a feature, I want to read the script and know it well enough so I can have ideas. But also you're translating the director's ideas. Yeah. Um, There are some directors who have very specific uh, visual information that, you know, that they need exactly the shot. Yeah. This is exactly what I want. And that's what you do. You, you know, you do that shot. Yeah. Yeah. Um, There's other directors who uh, are more amorphous and, hired you for a reason to give you a look and a certain feeling. And that's a great way to work too. There's different directors or different yeah. ways to work. Is there a place like when you're reading the script on that third read? Yeah. 
what kind of calculus are you doing in your brain to figure out all these things I'm talking about? The, the well, lensing, the on lighting, a, on the a movement. Feature, on a feature, when I'm doing a feature, I will sit down and actually write all this. I'll type it out on a list. I'll, I will have uh, uh, arcs of lighting. Mm-hmm. You know, the characters maybe start, maybe we don't see their eyes in the first third of, the, you know, until the first act. And maybe there's a shadow on their face. I mean, maybe there's all little subtle clues. Maybe we only see the uh, actor through a window all the time. Or yeah. there's always there's things that build up in your head. Where they come from, I have no idea. It's it's just years of information in my brain that comes out. But it's, and but I will it's coming pitch, through as... I will pitch ideas to directors like that. Would you say it's coming through as basically just a pure creative inspiration? Like, yeah. Like you're yeah. reading the script and this is just how, how you see it as you right. read it? Right, but uh, I will I will actually chart it out uh-huh. and say, okay, I will even chart, in the old days, I would chart what stock we're going to use. Oh, interesting. I would go, okay, we're going to shoot this on Kodak, you know, you know this, this, and we're going to use high speed for this, and we're going to use Fuji for this, you know, mm-hmm. just because I like the look of the color, and I really want it to pop for this scene. Yeah. Um, and then I, maybe I'll have a, an arc, I'll maybe have a filter arc too and maybe uh later on i need more filtration when we're lighting like this maybe i'll have a high key look but everyone's gonna have a little theme yeah and this is this is what's nice about features you really have time to think about things yeah yeah and really kind of plan them out so even if you're walking into a scene you're gonna know okay this scene i know what the scene's about you have to talk to the director what is the scene about is this about this person you know being dominant or is this person fading into the background? I'm fading from the microphone. You're um, doing good. You're but fine. all these things are pre-thought and these are discussions you have with the director. Yeah, yeah. So when you get onto a set, even if you don't have the exact drawing of what it's going to look like, you'll have an idea. Yeah, yeah. You know, this person, because of the character that they are, they're going to sit closer to the window or they're going to sit closer to a doorway. Is there, is there ways to frame so, this? So you're coming up with ideas even for character blocking. All the time. Yeah. All the time. So, and then when you try to, you know, you figure out blocking and what works and sometimes you walk onto a set and all these ideas in your, in your head and you'll do a rehearsal with the actor and they breathe life into it and everything changes. Yeah. Yeah. Everything changes. You go, Oh my God, that was amazing. And then you'll be, you just need to do it very simply or this needs to be exploded and do more. So every, everything has changed, but until you see the actor actually look through a lens. I always like to put up a lens with a director's finder and mm-hmm. see what it's going to look like. Um, until you actually see it and the life is being breathed, putting breath into it because everything else is paper before that. Yeah, yeah. Right. And maybe there's some mug shots you got or a lookbook <laughs> or, you know, it's like, okay, this is kind of what I was thinking. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we did, uh, I did a movie with Dave Payne uh, about Chippendales, right? Yeah. It was shot in the eighties. And I grew up in the 80s. It's not period. <laughs> Until you see the haircuts yeah, and the yeah. cars that people drive. And you're like, oh, wow, that is period. <laughs> and it's so strange. It's kind of foreign. But it's not foreign to you. So when you shot you it, it, when you shot it, it was period. Like you yeah, shot it in the we 90s. we shot it as period. And so, oh. like, people had special wigs, that, you know, were cut for the 80s. And, you know, it's kind of fun to do that kind of stuff and realize, you know, how much work has to go into actually making that a period piece. Yeah, yeah. Once you actually see them bring it alive. I think mm-hmm. that's what really brings it alive. And that's that's one of the crafts that just absolutely fascinates me. Acting? Acting. Oh, just yeah. see it come alive on the screen. That's just, uh, that is something I know nothing about. The people who are good at it, it's black black yeah. magic. It's, yes. so, it's so good when you see it done right. And you're just like, ooh, okay. And you yeah. see a performance and it could chill you through the spine. And really a lot of stuff when you do a cinematography is really in your gut. And at a certain point, I think it really has to feel right. It's bringing the truth. To the words. And I think that's the biggest thing about cinematography is huh. truth. Because when you, you can look at an image and you'll set something up and it doesn't look right. Yeah, yeah. And Because there's no truth in it. You have to figure out where the truth is. Isn't that odd? But That's very metaphysical. So it like, is. So how do, you, how do you go about finding the truth in something? Um, I think the only way to do it is keep looking for it and seeking out. And when it comes, when it appears, then you know it's right. Yeah. And I, all, all I can do is I can tell you it's wrong, it's wrong until it's right. Can Sometimes I'm, you have to like change things, you know, there's something wrong in the scene. What is wrong with the scene? So what's I'm, wrong with the composition? What's wrong with the lighting? There's something off. 
I want to connect this this philosophy though, because uh, you know, having worked f- for Corman as mm-hmm. you did, like you had to get to the truth of things very very quickly. You yeah, d- you didn't have time to hunt and peck. No, uh, no, and, and you, you know, never had that luxury ever. So how do you? I, I don't think I've ever had that luxury. How do you discipline yourself to find that? I mean, to me, that's like one of the most interesting things people anyone's ever said uh, on this podcast. How do you go about finding it? What is it? Is it coming from your experience? Is it just coming from your eye, from your creative? I I think it's just the accumulation of everything in your brain coming together and everything in your gut and everything you've lived your life through, every bit of information, everything that ever happened to you. Yeah. It's all, it's there. And once you see it, you're, you're making this fake thing, but you have to find the truth in this fake thing. Yeah. 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 And, and it's not real until it's real. You know, and you'll see it sometimes in performances of actors. You'll see it in, um, they'll do amazing. They'll do a rehearsal that just brings you to tears. And then uh, as soon as the camera turns on, something turns off. I've seen that. You And it's like, click. You're like, what's wrong? You know, I'm hoping, you know, you're like the director is seeing this. That's very important. It's like, do you see that? Okay. What do you do to, you know, bring that actor around? I don't know. You know, it's like, then, then that's the whole, that's the director's dilemma. Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's like, okay, everything else seems right. I think the truth visually is there, but the acting wasn't there. So there's something off and it, you have to keep exploiting the, the, the truth. And is there a reason you haven't continued to pursue directing or have you per- continued to pursue directing post uh, black scorpion? Um, I haven't had the opportunity. Is it something that you'd like to do? Yeah, probably. So it's in the back of my mind. Yeah. So, and I have directed since Black Square. That's it. Uh, I did have an opportunity on a show, but I turned it down for some reason. Huh. So, maybe I kick myself now for it. So, eh. but uh, yeah, I do try to think things through and use your brain, but also you're using your guts, man. I mean, it's really, it's in your stomach. You're going to feel it. Well, it sort of sounds that's, like that's the artist comes out, <laughs> you know? There's the artist as a cinematographer, and there is the technician. Yeah. And you can sit around and talk about gear and, you know, what's the latest 4K camera and, okay, that's good to know, but there's a lot of guys who just obsess about that stuff. Yeah, yeah. You know, and it's like, that's not really the craft. I mean, that's the craft is, for me, it's creating truth Yeah. on the screen. And how it's done, okay, it might be a, you know, a little Lumex camera that we shoot or you know it's might be it's 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 a accumulation of different things to find that right thing so interesting so so it sounds sort of like in answer to my my stock question that i keep asking everybody like to a degree it's more about getting there and feeling it on the day like you can plan and plan and plan Uh uh-huh but you want to get there and kind of make sure you're kind of the steward for the for the look well you have to have a plan you have to I mean, there's too many things going on and it's just making movies is a very expensive proposition, yeah, yeah. you know, and you, you think about, okay, this is cost, you know, a dollar a second or $6 a second. You know, I work on TV shows and we sit down and it's like, okay, it's $6 a second. Shoot this. You think about that. that yeah. <laughs> think quickly. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, when you really think of the, the financial thing that's involved here, but you want to just, you, you'll be able to make, um, quick decisions but that was my training from Corman or training just visually I mean I just goes back to looking at paintings and I still love going going to a museum and I have to look at painters from the you know 16th century and say how did they get that light correct you know and yeah, yeah. still it kind of blows your mind you're like oh that's kind of weird and how are they how did they get that light to look like that so and I'm still kind of experimenting like I don't think you ever learn lighting fully there's no you know you can fall into little traps where you get kind of stale and you say i'm gonna do this 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 you know yeah yeah you're doing tv series you have to you know there's certain little tricks that you're going to use to to get through it quickly through your day or whatever or have a certain look for you know we're in this room or you should look like this and but um you're also trying to change things up all the time yeah yeah. you're also testing the truth is this is would this look better let's try this you know, today's a different day. The light's different. Maybe the sun was over here and we move this around and does this look better? Yeah. You know, oh, that does. Okay. Why don't we kick a little light from underneath and see if that looks better? You know, there's always some new thing. Your brain is always like trying to paint pictures. Yeah. Yeah. It's keeping you, so, in, you engaged and that's what, creatively. That's, I see it as a painting. So that's part of my brain that says, okay, I'm painting this 
two-dimensional image here. Interesting. And I'm trying to make it look like 3D. Yeah, yeah. You know, it seems like when I look at uh, at your resume, you, you kind of have a lot of genre kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. And now you're doing a lot of like family children's kind of stuff. Yeah. Big change here. Yeah. It's like a, a big, a big swap from, you know, the, mm-hmm. the inevitable Bloody horror movies to <laughs> from children's le- television, yeah. leprechaun in the hood to, yeah. to children's television. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm obsessed with leprechaun in the hood. I've I seen know, it a bunch are, of, so. I, I, I like <laughs> that was when I met you the first time. That was one of the most impressive things. I'm like, this guy shot <laughs> leprechaun in the fucking hood in 12 days, in 12 days, 16 millimeter. Ah, nice. And you shot that. Didn't you guys shoot that at Lacey Street Studios, yeah, the, I think everything was shot there at Lacey Street. You, you, the and, good old Lacey Street. Yeah. You and saw. I love Lacey Street. I've shot there a few times. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's a cool place. It's so, a lot of texture, which is really nice when you're painting. Oh, light. yeah, yeah. texture. You see the walls have texture, and you can light the texture, and you can get you know, yeah, just the sense of things. You, know? you walk in there, and you real, yeah, exactly, yeah. and you see. I mean, like what the. It, it's a weird cheat because once you shot at like Lacey Street or the Herald Examiner or mm-hmm. Crazy Gideons or any of the places mm-hmm. that have like standing sets, you start pop, you start seeing them everywhere, right. and you're like, right. "Oh my, you lazy assholes! You right. just went in and just shot it the way it was built." Uh-huh. But um, but at the same time, I think you know, like it's great that those kinds of places exist, and uh, you know, Leprechaun in the Hood or and Saw the entire Saw the, the first Saw movie is entirely shot at Lacey Street, and if you watch mm-hmm. it, it's pretty obvious. But I, I sort of wanted to talk about like that trajectory of your career from from doing, you know, kind of genre stuff like Reeker and Lep in the Hood and stuff like that uh-huh. to to doing the kids stuff. And I don't know if it's fair to even ask you if you have a preference, but just like, you know, t- talk talk about working at those opposite poles. Oh, well, I think as a cinematographer, you have to be able to work in any genre, you know, from children's television comedy to bloody horror movies. And mm-hmm. I, I don't think you, I mean, there are people who get pigeonholed into one place or another and you should be able to do, uh, you know, just adult drama or, you know, just there's certain yeah. people talking about their emotions. I mean, <laughs> there's so many places in between and I think yeah. you have to, otherwise. Leprechaun talks about his emotion. Learning. He wants his gold. <laughs> you, But it's about pushing yourself. Yeah. You know, uh, I think, you know, early on I had a, uh, very uh i did a lot of dark movies mm-hmm. you know very dark um which i love i love dark movies because it, the scripts lend themselves to that yeah you know the the, the things i were shooting were very dark and very you know, on the darker side of the human psyche right yeah the stuff i do now is not on the dark side of the human psyche it's comedy and it's kind of fun and you know there's kids and it's great and i can do a different look and still make it look beautiful yeah right but it doesn't it's not a dark thing you know it doesn't have to be yeah yeah but you can still introduce things from your past you can kind of get away with a little bit maybe a little little bit more dark uh, than you'd normally see how i mean i did a children's show called uh, super ninjas uh-huh. that's a dark dark kid show yeah and it's on nickelodeon so uh, and it's pretty amazing that they uh we got away with a really kind of a nori look and it's and it's great i mean how did you end up getting into the kids stuff in the first place oh man uh <laughs> that's a good question i think i did my first thing for uh nickelodeon it was brothers garcia i was an operator on that mm-hmm. and i took over later on uh, carlos was the dp and okay I took over later he went on to another job and I took over his DP. So I think that was the first thing. So, mm-hmm. and so that, so Carlos just brought you in and then that got you in the door and then, yeah. and then he yeah. had to move on. So, right. and then you just kind of stuck around and it, yeah. Oh, for a little while. And then yeah. You know, you do other things and come back and then, you know, you do horror movie here and then you do that <laughs> and then you do, you know, but yeah, I was, I guess they know me for a while. So yeah. And you're a known entity. They like that. And as I'm looking at your stuff, I think your, your cinematography looks beautiful. Um, I can't put my finger on the, on the common thread. And obviously there are some DPs like, you know, like Robert Richardson Uh or Anthony Dodd mantle where you can kind of, you can kind of see their stuff pretty quickly. Uh There's some cinematographers who are chameleon like, and I, and I would kind of put you in, in a category of like, I can't necessarily like, I couldn't say like, that's a Mike Mickens shot right off the bat. Right. Is there something that you would say would typify your work per se? Uh, no, I don't think so. Really? No. I, I, I think it's, it, uh, yeah, it's truthful. I don't know. 
Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs> Hopefully. Yeah, I mean, maybe it's, the, some, it's something that's easier for somebody from the outside to see. I mean, it's like, I think your stuff looks amazing. Thank you. Um, Appreciate that. But, um, I, I, but I think every project is different. I don't, yeah. you can't just, you know, and every script is different. Yeah. You know, uh, is there a unifying, oh God, I don't know. I don't think there is. Mm-hmm. And, and I don't want there to be. Plus my career has been, it's a pretty long career. Yeah. That I've had. So I've gotten to change things. I mean, just watching under oath uh, 18 years ago I shot. Yeah, yeah. I made some really, really interesting choices that I don't know if I, today at my age I'd make the same choices. Like what kind of choices? Um, uh, Like scenes where you don't see the main characters. Mm-hmm. I mean, they're silhouettes, just totally. I don't know. You know, it's kind of interesting what you got. We get away with that. That was Roger Corman was pretty yeah. sure of that. He let us get away with a lot of good stuff. I mean, I have things where people sit back and they take a different key light and then yeah. they lean forward because it's more important and there's a different key light and it just totally shuts off in between interesting stuff like that. I'll yeah, show yeah. you I can show you footage of that stuff which, that's cool which which I say again but <laughs> so <laughs> you, I mean you, little you subtle funny. things like that you know yeah. uh, I mean a lot of that movie I shot with the camera is probably no more than three feet off the floor really yeah I mean a large part of that movie it's like right here and are those are yeah. ideas like that? Is that was that your idea or was yeah. the director's idea? That that from the start. Really? And I still remember being in a toilet, trying to take a toilet out so I can get a camera underneath where the toilet yeah. was. Going all because Orson Welles and t- di- digging a hole. Yeah, basically. It was and I remember having I think I had to be upside down and backward on the eyepiece to uh-huh. operate it. <laughs> oh Jesus. <laughs> so because we had jammed the camera in upside down, it was jammed up on the toilet like that. Yeah, yeah. And um and it was this one scene and, and Dave and I had worked the scene out and I, I was just like, he wanted to do this really big, extensive, like here, coverage, 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 a really important scene where um, the two the two cops are freaking out basically because they realize that they just killed uh, um, a federal agent. Yeah. And it was kind of a big mistake, right? And they're basically, and I just talked to Dave and I said, it's basically, we should block this very simply. It was because the actor basically he has his back to the wall. I said, why don't we just literally block it so his back's to the wall. So, and the only place I could actually put the camera inside a real, it was, we shot at the PE building downtown, was, it was nasty back then. It was just all, you know, kind of deserted then. I don't think scary. I know the building. The uh, uh, Pacific Electric building. Oh, oh. That was oh. beautiful lofts. Yeah, very, yeah. Very expensive real estate over there nowadays. Mm. But in the day it was abandoned and just really kind of cool. So you could shoot really cool stuff. Places and like we that put the police station there, and they built the sets. Some some of the sets we built that uh, on stage, and and some of them were right there at the PE building. And uh, it's this bathroom was just paint peeling off the walls. It was beautiful. I loved it. It was just so. Um, uh, what's the Japanese term? There's a Japanese term for it. it's called wabi sabi. Where oh really? Yeah, it's basically it's the beauty of um, uh, of things falling apart degradation degradation nice but it's the beautiful you know i actually do a lot of still photos of Mm -hmm. wabi sabi it's kind of like a fascinating uh weird thing of mine um interesting so Ah. i I like to see things that are aged naturally over time and this is like the paint is peeled and and water's run down the walls and the sink is I love places falling like that. over and it's rusted and Have you been to the Herald Examiner where they like demolished the one building and there's just the underneath the foundation? No. Oh dude, you got to go over really? there. It's like it's falling to pieces. It's oh, gorgeous. It's really? like so it was two buildings originally uh-huh. and the one that has all the sets in it is still there and then they demolished the second one. Oh shit. Yeah. And it's just uh, it's it's so it's everything that was below the foundation so it's like uh, old rusted out eye beams uh-huh, and falling uh-huh. apart insulation. I'm sure you're getting nine k- kinds of cancer every time yeah. you walk under oh, there. Oh yeah, yeah. But uh, and I'm starting to see it pop up. Like we shot there, we shot because we were at the Herald Examiner. We shot part of Chosen in there. Mm-hmm. Um, but now I've I've seen it in a few other things, and it just looks like a blighted, horrible post-apocalyptic yeah. city. Which which I totally dig. And I, yeah, <laughs> you know, I'll take that any day. So that's like your a style. Real location. Got it. I mean, yeah. Uh, take, but take it's that my still style. I do a lot of stuff on you know Instagram or whatever. I'll post that kind of thing. Um, those are things I really like to mm-hmm. 
kind of uh, look at the natural beauty of. I'm, I'm with you see. on that. I, I love that yeah. too. It's one of the, like, cause I'm from Florida and there's none of that there. Cause right, a building new. is 15 years old. Right. They tear it down and start over. Everything's new. But like, yeah, coming out here and seeing like really old beaten to shit places, yeah. like, you know, with like real texture and stuff. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's beautiful. It's one of the great things about New Orleans too. They just right. kind of let everything or go over to there. Europe and just see the real yeah. aging, or, you know, places that have been around for a long time. Yeah, just yeah. See it. That's what's kind of important. The um, okay, enough wabi sabi. I think that's awesome. Not enough the, wabi sabi. We could do a whole wabi sabi podcast. It's a wabi sabi podcast. Um, wabi sabi. That's my still work. That's different. So. Is it? Yeah, sure. I think your still work is you don't you don't think it informs your cinematography at all? Oh, of course it does. Yeah. That's where I experiment with things. Yeah, yeah. So that's, I, I think a lot of it was uh, just shooting a lot of stills and learning about light. I mean, that was that was one way I taught my eye to look at things. Yeah. You know, it was like, I would see what nature brought me and I would see things. I was always looking, looking, looking. I still am. I look for different, you know, yeah. why is that reflection there? Why is there a weird thing coming through the light? And you're like, what is that? Okay. You, yeah. <laughs> you have to find out what made that. And it's like, can I ever reproduce that? Would I need, what would I need to, to make that? Cause I want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. You know? Well, I guess, I guess you, you answered the question though about, about working on kind of like dark horror, grossy stuff, yeah, bloody stuff. And then moving over to, uh, not necessarily bloody, but scary. Yeah. I think there's a difference. Mm-hmm. There's bloody and then there's scary. Which I like the scary portion, but mm-hmm. not necessarily the bloody portion. <laughs> I like them both. I know. You like the gore. But, you know, gore can be overdone. Of course. Anything you know? can be overdone. And I think I think it's scarier when you see less. Uh-huh. I think when you let the audience um, kind of let the their imaginations run, I think that's scarier. Yeah. When yeah. you just show somebody's head getting cut off or whatever, I mean, okay, uh, that's it, you know? Yeah. <laughs> but... Yeah. If you give them the opportunity to maybe see the blood splatter on the wall or something like that, that's that's a different, you know, yeah. I think that's even scarier because in your mind it's even worse. You know, of course. anything you photograph, okay, whatever. That well, and that's the savior that of, 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 like, of like any movie where the monster, you know, like yeah. famously with Jaws where right. they chose to just show very little of the shark. Mm-hmm. Exactly. For a reason, because it didn't work. Probably, yeah, but. no, that's exactly uh, why, because it, it didn't work and it looked yeah, stupid, so they shouldn't. But he worked around those. Yeah, issues, yeah. You know, and I think maybe that's how Corman, you're like, okay, that they kind of, you get those aesthetics. Yeah. It's like, we can't really do this because it's too expensive. So figure out a way to make it scary and not show it. Now, we, we don't tend to talk that much technology, but mm-hmm. I do think that it's worth bringing up something you said earlier about how in the days of Corman, there were no um vi- video village there wasn't yeah. there weren't video taps no and there so, were occasionally but there were the but black the and white part, taps which were crappy yeah they just gave you a sense of composition yeah that's about it um so and the directors didn't sit there and look at them so they they sat next to the camera so what and uh, saw the actor is it perform. A, is it a net benefit for the culture or is it uh or are we losing something by having everybody in on every decision involving cinematography um I, I think it's the detriment of cinematography, having all the monitors. I do. I think overall, there used to be a trust between director and cinematographer. Yeah. That now everybody can say, hey, what, what about this and this? And, you know, have a comment about it. So. Yeah. Because now it's all there in HD or 4K or whatever. Yeah. Every big monitor is there and, you know, which also helps you a lot too because, you know, the hair person is going to go, oh, that hair's out of place. Let's, let me go fix it without yeah. having to ask, you know? So there's certain benefits and there's certain yeah, bad things, but there's also good things. So it's kind of a mixed bag. I think it, it's there and it's permanent. So this is how it's going to work from the future on. Of course. It's only going to get more so, I'm sure. Uh, the interesting part is you really, you know, dailies are, you don't need to. You see it's on the screen. Do you anymore, ever screen that's dailies? That's what it's going to look like. Do you ever screen dailies though? Like I've always wondered. I like, do. I get screen dailies from like, my show. Do every you day. show them to the crew? Do you show them at lunch or? Oh, we're sent as emails. Oh, okay. Everything's so, emailed nowadays. So you just watch it on your computer? You watch it on your computer. You sit down, you know, when you get home maybe, or usually I'll load it up at the end of the week or, you know, I'll say, oh, this is what I did. Talk to my wife, have a glass of wine. <laughs> say, this is what I did this week. You know, what do you think of that? Oh, she'd be like, oh, that's nice or, you know, whatever. Or she'd yeah. be like, that's boring. I don't want to talk about it. I, I'm just going to really ask you one more question. And this is okay. kind of a philosophical question. Uh-oh, philosophy. Um, <laughs> and the, the question is, 
sort of the uh, director DP relationship. And if you were to build a director from scratch, how, how would you want to work? What is the most ideal way that you would work with a director? Wow. <laughs> can you build them from scratch? You can. They, they have like Le- they come in kits? Lego kits. Are they made somewhere like in China? You can like buy them online. <laughs> the, like build the, a director kit. The Chinese ones usually come with the metric screws and they're harder. <laughs> they're, they're wrong. <laughs> and they fall wrong. apart. You just can't get <laughs> they parts. They last long. <laughs> so, they're not a quality. Really. The Hong Kong ones are pretty good though. Oh, okay. No, but like, so if you were to, if you were to make uh, like, I'm, I'm just always curious about like some, some DPs want a director to come in and tell them exactly what they want. And mm-hmm. then they're going to execute that. It sounds to me like you're somebody who comes in with a lot of ideas to the table, which is great. Mm-hmm. Um, I think you have to, as a, as a DP, that's part of your job is have mm-hmm. ideas mm-hmm. and opinions. I think, um, well, obviously it is. Uh, there's no ideal director. I think it would be boring to have an ideal director. Mm-hmm. I mean, that's part of your job is to analyze and figure out what the director wants and how he works. I mean, yeah. that's really part of, you have to absorb how the director's gonna wanna work. I mean, they may wanna do this way and this way, and this is gonna be different from the last director. The one thing about television is you get to work with a different director every week. Mm-hmm. So you really kinda can get like, a, like okay, oh, that's kinda interesting way to work, and then, oh, that's a different way to work. And yeah. there's no ideal way to work. I mean, everyone works so differently, just like personalities. It's like, you know, snowflakes. Yeah. Um, but I guess I'm asking like, like about, about the level of collaboration or what, what, what kind of collaboration you would, what, where you want your collaboration to go into. Do you want your co- collaboration to go into figuring out the actual coverage? Do you want the director to come in with like, here are the rules. Do you want to come in and pitch the rules? Do you want to negotiate? I mean, like, I, I think that it's a valid answer to say, I just, what I enjoy about it is figuring out different directors and figuring out how to give them what they need. That's it. That is it. Yeah. I mean, really, I mean, it's not rocket science that we're doing. We're mm-hmm. just making entertainment for people. Yeah. Um, there's different ways to work and just, there's so many different ways to work and even the way I work changes. So what's the ideal DP? What's the director want? Mm-hmm. I mean, you kind of have to figure out, um, the situation and, and the material there. I mean, there's, I mean, a director can work one way and then two years later you work with the same director and they work in a different way. Yeah. You know, they have very specific ideas or maybe that time you work with them, they just, you know, went through a divorce and their mind is somewhere else. And, yeah. <laughs> and you got to like, okay, um, this is something that's changed. So let's figure it out and work it. I mean, it's individual. I mean, you, so different you know and i work on different directors i work with some of the same directors on different tv shows Mm -hmm. so it's like okay this is a weird goofy you know strange show and then this is a more serious show and you know so there's different everything's different okay i think i think that's fair you know yeah yeah i don't know if i answer that no i think maybe i'm just like trying to dig in for my own information like what Mm -hmm. what do dps want from directors in general um um i want you to be present and smart. Mm. That's what I want. I want a director to be smart. Okay? Intelligence has to be there. That's so important in a director. But there's different types of intelligence. There's uh, mental intelligence. There's artistic intelligence. There's social intelligence. Yeah. There's all different types of intelligence. And I want to learn from the director maybe something new. Yeah. You know, because I'm always a student. I think I'm always learning. You got to learn everyone you meet, you're going to learn something new about. So I think it's kind of fun to, uh, meet different types of people. And, you know, it's also great to work with the same people over again, cause you kind of know, uh, how they think. Yeah. You know, sometimes, you know, there's certain directors I work with that I can finish their sentence, you know, they say, why don't we do that? And I'll finish the sentence for them. Yeah. Yeah. Because we kind of, you know, work together so long that we've known each other for a really long time. So it's kind of like, boop, boop, you know? But then there's new people and you'll be like, oh, that's kind of a cool way to direct. I kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> you know, just maybe processing it in my own brain. Like, yeah. how would I be as a director? Mm-hmm. You know, so. When you direct again. When I direct again. So, I mean, uh, it, it'll come. Um, I'll have the opportunity. Always, Opportunity always knocks. 
Well, that's great, man. I think um, that, I think that's a good place to leave it. Um, before we go, um, where can people find you online? Um, you you have a website, Twitter, Instagram. They can find me at uh, mikemickens.com. M i k e m i c k e n s dot com. And you can find me at on Instagram at mickenspics. And we can see some of those awesome de- degradation photographs you were talking yeah, about. Some of them are up there. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Mike Mickens, thank you so much for coming to the Cinematography Podcast. Thank you. All right, so that was Mike Mickens. Mike, thank you for coming on the show. Yeah. Sincerely. And I'm sorry it took me so long to edit it, but, you know. You've been very patient and waited a very long time, longer than anybody else. Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, actually, I don't think that's true. Um, I, I, oh, really? I think the first one we did, it was... Jason almost- Wingrove? It was probably over a year before it, before we did it. <laughs> um, anyway, so now, now now I feel horrible and small. So that's uh, okay, you know. All right, so who is our war story from today, Ilya? Our war story is from very talented director of photography, Bill Totolo. Take it away, Bill. And now war stories. The gig was I was doing press for Survivor. I was working at TV Guide, and CBS has a part ownership in TV Guide, so they had their own in-house crew go out and do it, and so did TV Guide. But a friend of mine had done that for like a decade. His name is Greg Cabrera. Greg was about 52 and sadly passed away of a heart attack. So it was very bittersweet. Like It was a great, great gig, but very sad the way I got it. We're going to interview every contestant, so there's like 20 contestants. Then we're going to go shoot the first challenge, then we're going to shoot a little bit of life in the camp, and then we're going to do first tribal council, and then we have to go home. And it takes about eight days. So we fly, I think it was like 14 hours to Manila, and then another three hours up to Tagagero, and then another three-hour drive up to Cagayan Valley, where we were. So we're really remote. It's really hot. We didn't really have a lot of food. And the reporter next to me goes down and starts having a seizure. She was just dehydrated, turns out. Literally, the medic was there in under five minutes, put a saline drip into her. They did everything right. They got her into the hospital. She was fine. They just had to put her into a hospital for 24 hours. But that's day one, my first day on the job. Day two, we had like a really early call time, like 3 a.m., and we were wrapped by 2 o'clock because we were doing the first challenge. We had to get the sunset, everybody arriving by helicopter, by boat, by jeep. It's really dramatic, and we had a lot of fun shooting it. So we're wrapped by 2 o'clock. One of my buddies, who shall remain nameless, is like a world-class surfer. Super buff guy, very healthy. But he wants to go out and enjoy some surf in the Philippines because he'll be able to check that off his bucket list. So there were some dark clouds. And he sarcastically says to his assistant, hey, nobody finds me, send out search patrol. We proceed to go to the resort that Survivor had built for the Philippine government there. One of the army bases got wiped out by a tsunami. And so literally they go in and rebuilt it and tur- turned into a five-star resort. So we're in the heated Olympic sized swimming pool. We're drinking Filipino beer. We're just having a good time unwinding. And yeah, a storm rolls in. And they ask us to get out of the pool. And we're like, no, we're not getting out of the pool. You know, we're all salty, you know. We're drinking beers. We're like, we're spending money. So we're fine. It, it was fine. But my buddy's assistant comes running up. She's like, hey, have you seen, uh, seen so-and-so? Uh, I haven't seen him. I know he went out surfing. Has anybody seen him? I'm a little concerned. We're having a couple beers while I'm winding. He's fine. He's a big boy. I'm sure he's just on the shore drying off. She, She's like, no, really, I think I'm a little concerned. You know, the storm looks pretty bad out there. Should we send out a search party? And we're like, he went out doing what he loved. <laughs> we're really giving it to him. They're like, you know, he would want us to carry on, <laughs> you know. Turns out he did get washed out to sea. They found him holed up on Turtle Island, freezing, and <laughs> just nothing but his trunks. I think by day three, most of the crew got hit by intestinal virus. And I was very hesitant to check in because they flew me halfway around the world. I'm trying to do my job, trying to be professional, but it's like 90 degrees out and I've got the chills and cold sweats and I realize my joints ache. I've got to admit that I'm not feeling well. So I go into the medic begrudgingly and I have to sign in a ledger. The ledger's like three inches thick. So the whole crew is signed in, like 400 people. First thing she says to me, she goes, well, I don't think it's dengue fever because they had a couple of people get dengue fever, which is really bad. It's like malaria. So I'm like, let's not open with, I don't think it's dengue fever. <laughs> I got rid of the virus. I blew it out in like 24 hours. I was fine. So that was like that day. 
I guess around the fourth or fifth day, we had to go out to the island to shoot some, I guess, lifestyle shots of them coping with the island. They warned us, like, you know, the ocean's a little rough. Bag all your gear up. And so we went out on this, like, 20-foot by 10-foot aluminum boat. And, yeah, there's, like, four-foot swells, and we're going out there. And I was actually kind of enjoying it. I put a GoPro on some speed rail, and I'm getting great shots of that. But, yeah, the public's just looking a little green. But for the most part, it was kind of fun. And we get out there to the island, and the island's just gorgeous. It's beautiful. It's surrounded in uh, just shells and coral and just it's like paradise. But they literally had to carve in like a camp for one team, a camp for the other, and then down the middle was camera camp. Like it was really uninhabitable. It was just all jungle. So we get off the boat, we make a water landing, we get into uh, camera camp, and we're just getting some water, getting some supplies, cleaning the cameras before we take off and shoot the two camps. And I just happen to notice nobody's directing my attention to anything, but there's some computer printouts of dangerous indigenous species on the picnic table. And I'm thinking, it's probably common sense for me to acquaint myself with this. Picture, if you will, four computer laminated pictures of snakes. And so one is a black snake, one's a brown snake, one's a green snake. Black snake says, this black snake likes to hang out in the foliage, mildly poisonous. If you get bit, we have antidote, come back to camp. Green snake hangs out in the trees and the leaves. Hard to see, look up for him. Mildly poisonous if you get bit, come back to base camp. Brown snake, same thing. The last snake is a picture of a coiled up snake with his mouth wide open launching at you. It's called flying snake. So now I am paranoid, I can't do my job. I'm walking around looking for the black snake, the brown snake. I'm listening for the coiled up flying snake. We're going back to base camp from the island and the waves had gone to 12 feet. So now we're in this little boat and waves are breaking over the bow and people are throwing up and the gear is just washing everywhere. It's, it's protected in plastic bags, but picture your boat going vertical and then crashing into the ocean. And we are two miles out and I realize if this boat goes down, I'm not getting to shore. We are in deep ocean. We're piloting the boat between jagged rocks. So it's literally the only moment on a shoot where I ever felt nobody's got my back out here. There's, no swift water rescue there's no rescue team you know i literally looked up and i prayed to god and i said if you take me just please take me fast just don't let a fish eat me i mean i just realized my my life's not in my hands at that point hindsight being 2020 it was a great adventure and i was so happy to be on it but we started out with seizures buddy getting washed out to shore flying snakes don't let a fish eat me And now, short ends. So that was Bill Totolo. Look forward to him sometime in 2019 when I cut the next episode. Oh, man. It will not be 2019. It will still be 2016. I'm, I'm going <laughs> to... What I'm going to do is I'm going to wait for your son, who just went into the first grade, to be uh, graduating. graduating from college, <laughs> and he'll help me edit it. Uh, all, right, all right. So um, to our listeners, we are making a pledge... I am now also learning the editing software to which edit the shows. Sh- shows will come out faster. All right. So, uh, Ilya, what is your short end today? My short end today, my obsession of the week is the television series, Mr. Robot. It's a USA series, although I've been watching it, I believe, on Amazon VOD. And uh, that's where I'm watching it. It is it is really, really well shot, is a really, really well shot show. And as far as I can tell so far, there's been two different DPs who've uh, who've worked on it and they've done a great job of carrying the look through from episode to episode. Like, you know, it's basically the look is set and you would not notice a a difference from from one to the other. And uh, the thing that I'm really enjoying, I would say more so than any show I can think of in recent memory is the really creative use of framing. And if you watch the shows, particularly in the dialogue scenes, there is just this leading, non-leading, you know, eyes fixed in corners of frames and shot reverse shots that are not what you would expect. And I find myself going, oh my God, what's in, what's the next shot? What's the turnaround going to be? What's what it's what's going to follow? This? I totally have been doing the same thing and I didn't realize I was doing it. Like it's such an eccentrically framed uh thing and it's but it's done so methodically like it breaks every rule of normal quote-unquote normal composition and totally gets away with it it well here's the thing i don't think you break the rules 
when you pull it off. When you pull that off, and there is no, I mean, there's no way that they are not pulling that off. Like, I didn't ever see them go so far, violate the 180 degree rule or violate any sort of the traditional the traditional framing and not be able to pull it off with the reverse. The reverses are always so spot on and there's a lot of mirroring that goes on with the negative space around people. And it's yeah. like, you'll have this head in the bottom of the frame, a huge amount of headroom, you know, completely looking the opposite direction you would expect. And then you're like, Oh my God. Okay. What's with this frame. But then the next frame is like a wonderful symmetry to the first one. It, it's, it's brilliant use of editing. It's brilliant use of production design. The uh, operators who are, who are working the cameras, absolutely must be masters of what they're doing so kudos out to them kudos out to uh tim ives and todd campbell who have been shooting the show uh if there's other cinematographers imdb doesn't have that that listed yet and i'll have to go through and look at the episodes but wow you know great work on on your frame great work on the lighting you know congratulations And did they actually shoot that in new york do you know it I mean, looks like New York. I mean, yeah, they got like scenes I mean, in Coney Island. You can't really fake that. It, well, you know, it's 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 crazy what you can fake, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say that looks like a New York show. I should look in the credits. It probably has like a, you know, shot in NY yeah. type of logo. So, no, anyway. I'm, I've, I've been finding it very impressive. I've been watching it a, a lot myself. So, Ben, what is your short end? This so week? I'm going to copycat you and, you and do a television series. Whoa. And that television series is Hannibal, which is about to get canceled. Whoa, I have not seen it, so now I am I feel bad for not watching it. Well, uh, I can loan you the Blu-rays of seasons one and two. Ooh. Uh, although, you can, if you have Amazon Prime, I think you can watch them there, too. Oh, um, I'd rather watch the Blu-rays. They look better. Yeah. Um, so, uh, you should know that The Silence of the Lambs, if it isn't my favorite movie of all time, is probably in the top five. I, I could create a language that was made out of nothing but Silence of the Lambs quotes. Mm-hmm. And yet I've she always puts the lotion in the basket <laughs> <laughs> or then she gets the hose again. I don't know the quotes, but that's ready like... when you are Officer of Pembry. <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, yeah, I love that movie. Um, but I have found every other Thomas Harris adaptation to be wanting uh, Manhunter, the Michael Mann movie. People like that. Um, I think it's OK. It's obviously super dated. It's about as 80s as a TV show could look um, or as a movie could look rather. Um, the Brett Ratner, Red Dragon, eh, it's all right. Um, the Ridley Scott follow up to the Silence of the Lambs, Hannibal. Yeah. Eh, it, it, it does have one of the most horrifying scenes I've ever seen on film, mm. which are, is, are you talking about the, the finale sort of scene with the, the Ray Liotta? Yeah. Yeah. The brain eating, making, making so, Ray Liotta eat his own brain. That is, that is really disturbing. And I have to say, I did kind of really enjoy that movie in part for that scene. Yeah, no, I agree. I mean, like, I think I think it's a good movie, but it, it didn't really stay with me. Hannibal Rising, not a huge fan. Mm, missed and, that one. And then when Hannibal, the TV series came out, I was like, I was unfamiliar with the people who created it because I never watched Pushing Daisies. Mm. And um, and uh, all my horror buddies were like, you have to see this. And I'm like, ah, like, I just don't want to have my heart broken again by yet another spin off of it and of a horror sh- a horror on television on a major network note yeah on N- on nbc yeah it's like how how far out could nbc go because it's nbc i mean if it was fx or uh, amc or hbo or something you believe it so anyway so uh alicia my wife and i were on an airplane and they had like free tv streaming to your ipad and the i was worst way to watch anything of an course airplane. of course <laughs> so but i'm like okay they got the first three episodes of hannibal i'm coming back from ohio this will be <laughs> This will pass the time. And I started watching it. And from the first scene, it just had me by the balls. It is so good. And it, and it, uh, it's basically the prequel to red dragon for the most part. Now the current season, season three is starting about half the halfway point is red dragon. Hmm. They're retelling red dragon. in what I would say is the best telling of that story hmm. by far. Um, the actors are great. Hugh Dancy and Mods Mickelson and Lawrence Fishburne and the whole, the whole cast are just amazing but i want to shout out to the uh to the cinematography which is just stunning some of the best stuff i've seen on tv and the main cinematographer on the show is a fellow named james hawkinson um but uh, to my surprise when i looked it up one of the other dps or the only other dp listed on imdb is a guy named kareem hussein who i sort of know i met him at the fantasia film festival years ago in uh, montreal fantastic um, but this show is like Imagine like a very smart, much smarter version of Dexter as conceived of by like David Lynch. You can tell that there's a heavy David Lynch uh, influence. It gets very, very surreal, Um, especially in the first two seasons. There's this stag character that's sort of this mishmash of animals 
that Will Graham keeps uh, hallucinating in, in various places. Would you say that it is David Lynchian and its influence and homage in the way that like Mr. Robot is clearly influenced and paying homage to Stanley Kubrick and David Fincher? Yes, I would. And I'm glad that you said Stanley Kubrick in regards to that because I keep thinking the same thing when I'm watching it. Um, but uh, back, on, back to you or back to Hannibal. Sorry for back, no, 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 that's fine. Okay. But the yeah, the cinematography is also like in this third season, it's almost fetishistically um, sensual. And and so much of it's I, I hate to say it because it's, it's sensual about cannibalism. It is. Oh. And it but it's some of the best food photography you will ever see. Now, is it food or is it people? Uh, or is people food? Uh, often it's a bit of both, <laughs> okay. can I say? All right. So so there's there's cooking. You know, it's the whole taking the fava beans to the next level. Yeah. I will say that, uh, and uh, I don't have many complaints about this show, but I've been waiting for a census taker to try and test him and then have him eat his liver with fava beans <laughs> and a nice candy. There has been no census taker ever in the show. And I and I, I mean, like I watch these show these episodes, you know, the pretty fin- closely. The finale is coming up. Maybe they'll. That's true. They'll, <laughs> no, they'll no, sneak it in. No, because we're in Red Dragon territory now, and Hannibal is already uh, uh, locked up. That was part of the fun of it, though. Is it's like Mods Mickelson is such a charismatic actor, and you're with him the whole way, and you're kind of rooting for Hannibal Lecter, and. It's like you we all know where he ends up like, you know, there's no there's no obfuscation that Hannibal Lecter ends up behind bars, but you're sort of hoping he'll get away with it, which is such a crazy magic trick because he's a terrible, horrible character and and a completely different interpretation than Anthony Hopkins. I mean, Anthony Hopkins uh, interpretation is classic and brilliant and, you know, one of the best performances, you know, in my opinion, in, in all of film history. Uh, Mons Mikkelsen throws it away and does a completely different Hannibal Lecter, which is thoroughly respectable. And in a lot of ways, uh, you know, it doesn't it doesn't replace Anthony Hopkins, but it almost makes you wish the show wasn't being canceled before they got to Silence of the Lambs. Because I, I even heard uh, rumblings that they were uh, potentially going to get Ellen Page to play uh, Clarice Starling, which would be inspired as well. Yeah, OK, so you talked a lot about the show and the cast and the and the story and everything else. And you mentioned that the cinematography was sensual. But what else makes it like a David Lynch? What what else? Is there something as a surreal aspect? There's in there? there's outrageously surreal aspect. Well, like I was saying, there's this stag character that's that's an, it's a fully CGI um, monster sort of that kind of represents a hallucinatory version of Hannibal Lecter in Will Graham's imagination that shows up in real locations all the time. Um, the, uh, and I do think that the cinematography gets like fetishistically fussily perfect. Mm-hmm. Like it, it, and maybe this is part of how we, how we find, how I find myself on Hannibal Lecter's side is that Hannibal Lecter is someone who's kind of trying to achieve certain kinds of perfection and they, they are going out of their way to do that with the cinematography. Um, it, it does some stuff, uh, not unlike Breaking Bad, you know how Breaking Bad maybe would start an episode with sort of a cold opening kind of a thing that was like an image that you don't know what it is. And then by the end you would find out what it was. Yeah. Or a little bit of a flash forward to something you're going to get to. Yeah. Well, in, in season two of Hannibal is nothing but a flash forward. It starts with the end of the season and then flashes back. You've convinced me. I think I now have to watch it. Good for you. So, but no, but for everybody else out there. So, so check out Hannibal and uh, you know, I, I understand that uh, it's Brian Fuller. I think who, who makes the show. Uh, he's moving on to an adaptation of Neil Gaiman's American Gods, which sounds pretty damned awesome as well. So he, so uh, supposedly Hannibal is actually dead. They can't get it going in a different network or, mm-hmm. or Netflix or anything. But there have been rumblings of them possibly trying to continue it. And I would be very interested to see how they tweak the story to keep Will Graham in Clarice Starling's world because uh, he is not in the book or the movie. Mm-hmm. So that about wraps it up for us for episode Ocho. Ocho. That's right. Episode eight. Thank you very much to all of our subscribers. Oh, a bit of housekeeping. Uh, we've changed the website. We are no longer located at the cinematography podcast.com or cinematography podcast.com. If you went to the other URL, we are now located at camnoir.com. It's shorter, it's easier. And hopefully our RSS feed is all working with iTunes. So hopefully all of you will get this who are subscribed and please subscribe and tell your friends and, and rate us on, on yeah. iTunes. If you like us, give us positive comments and uh, you know, you it, can also email us. You can email us. We're like Tinkerbell. If we get enough uh, positive comments, we'll release a new episode. 
<laughs> we're going to release another episode regardless, but, you know, please, We, got, we have please. three more in the can, so what yeah, are you going to there, do? Yeah, there's, there's a couple more behind this, so hopefully quick succession we'll get a few. Uh, please hire Kay's Alatrachi, who did all of our music, and uh, pay him a lot of money to compose an awesome score for you. You can find him at www.musicbykays.com. Thank you very much, and we'll see you next time. Or you'll hear us next time, or whatever sense organs you're using. Stop talking. Bye. This has been the Cinematography Podcast, presented by Hot Rod Cameras. Find your next camera, lens, or accessory on the web at hotrodcameras.com. Don't forget to subscribe to our show on iTunes and connect with us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for listening.